Varieties of Antinatalism Introduction The short description of antinatalism on Wikipedia currently reads Antinatalism is the ethical view that negatively values procreation. Antinatalists argue that humans should abstain from procreation because it is morally wrong. Yet behind this simplicity lies a variety of positions we could call antinatalistic. Here we'll take a walk through the parent garden of antinatalism. Who is concerned? The first major question to ask is, who are we concerned with when thinking about antinatalism? It seems to me we can either think of the one who potentially could be brought into existence or the one who brings another into existence. The former view I shall call the subject affecting antinatalism since we place focus on the subject who could be radically affected by procreation. It is explicated by this quote by Heine. Sleep is lovely, death is better still, not to have been born is of course the miracle. The latter I shall call the agent perspective view since we focus on the agent who performs the morally relevant action. We get a glimpse of this view from Flaubert. The idea of bringing someone into the world fills me with horror. I would curse myself if I were a father, a son of mine. Oh no 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 no. May my entire flesh perish and may I transmit to no one the aggravations and the disgrace of existence. Evaluation or prescription? The second question would be, are we making a value judgment or are we making a prescription for action? This distinction will inevitably be directly connected to the first one about who is concerned. But this time we are focused either on the harms that come with being brought into the world or on saying that people should not procreate. The first view I shall call pessimistic antinatalism. This position grounds antinatalism on the nature of existence. The title of Benatar's 2006 book is the perfect exemplification of this. Better never to have been. We can trace this sentiment to ancient Greece, quoting Sophocles. Never to be born is the best thing, to have seen the daylight and be swept instantly back into dark oblivion comes second. Sophocles is very clear that being born is bad for the one who comes into existence and that not to be born would be the best for him. The second view I shall call moral antinatalism. This is the view that puts weight on the act of procreation itself. It is wrong on this view to bring another into existence and we should not do it. It is a breach of a moral principle. The most prominent philosopher espousing this particular form of antinatalistic ideas is Julio Cabrera. One can also make arguments along these lines based on Immanuel Kant's moral philosophy. al Maari gives us a taste of this position. This is my father's crime against me, which I myself committed against none. The two views are not entirely distinct, of course, we usually find them mingled together, yet it is possible to disentangle them for analysis. The scope. The next set of anti-natalistic sentiments is directly connected to the first question. But now we consider the scope of those who are concerned, rather than just the perspective. By scope I mean who are those that count in the moral consideration of a given antinatalistic position? The most obvious choice is to consider human beings. We are humans, so we are biased to think more about our own than about others. Here we would say that it is either bad for humans to come into existence or that it is wrong that people bring others, humans or non-humans, into this world. This view I shall call anthropocentric antinatalism. This view is made clear by Cabrera. Killing someone and giving birth to someone are two violent actions through which, magically, man tries to put himself in God's place. The victim of a homicide is always helpless, but never as helpless as the victim of a birth. Childbirth spills as much innocent blood as a homicide. 
The natural extension of this view is towards all sentient animals. Since suffering is an intrinsic part of life as a sentient being, for every such being it is better never to have been. It is not possible, however, to extend the moral prescription to other beings, as they generally do not operate in the moral domain. I will label this position animal antinatalism. We see this idea in Al Ma'ari. The lizard's ancestors are the cause of its being hunted. Further, we may think of types of beings that could be sentient but which don't even exist yet, such as sentient artificial intelligence or sentient machines. The logic applies straightforwardly. For a sentient machine, it is also bad to come into existence to suffer, and therefore moral agents, such as us, should not bring them into the world. We can call this view AI antinatalism. When we have three quite distinct positions about the scope, we can encompass all of them in the universal antinatalism, which states that for every sentient being, coming into existence is a tragedy. And those of us who can recognize this and make moral judgments should not bring those beings into the world. We can look at this quote by Leopardi as expressing such a sentiment. To that creature being born, its birthday is a day to mourn. The impact on definitions. Just above, we've seen a couple of possible perspectives on antinatalism, where each puts a focus on a different aspect of procreation or views coming into existence from a different perspective. The list is by no means exhaustive. This becomes important when we go about defining antinatalism. When someone attempts to base the definition on a particular line of argumentation, for example the consent argument, then one will inevitably conclude with anthropocentric moral antinatalism. This will make him blind to the variety of antinatalistic views in current literature as well as in the history of thought as a whole. A similar situation can already be found in philosophy. We have many different constructivisms, idealisms, consequentialisms, ethical realisms and so on. This happens whenever an area of thought becomes fruitful and invites nuance and internal debate. It is no different with antinatalism. Antinatalists approach the topic from different angles, focus on different aspects, look at the problem from new perspectives. What we end up with is a number of antinatalistic positions. Any attempt at definition has to capture this diversity of opinions, approaches and methods. Conclusion I showed a few antinatalistic positions that can already be found in the philosophical literature. Each specific position may have its lines of argumentation, philosophers and history. I would reserve the term antinatalism for the overall category of positions that negatively value coming into existence and procreation. This is also important for looking at definitions and counting various pessimistic views of life as antinatalistic. If we start with an argument that is strictly tied to one specific position, it may skew our definition by unnecessarily narrowing it down, thus excluding some antinatalistic views. Maybe it would be more productive to discuss various antinatalistic positions rather than bicker about what the true antinatalism is supposed to be.